Well, good afternoon, all my brothers and sisters in Christ uh, from Redeemer Reformation Church, and I hope you're having a blessed Lord's Day, and also welcome to anybody who's visiting our YouTube channel, and uh, if you're tuning in for the first time, uh, we are in the middle of a sermon series where we're going through the Lord's Prayer, and so we come to uh, the third petition of the Lord's Prayer this afternoon, which is found in Matthew 6, verse 10. Uh, But let's turn our attention to our scripture passage now. Uh, I'll read from Matthew chapter 6 and verses 5 through 13. So Matthew chapter 6 and verses 5 through 13. Let's give our attention to God's holy, inerrant, and inspired word now. And when you pray, you must not be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and at the street corners that they may be seen by others. Truly I say to you, they have received their reward. But when you pray, go into your room and shut the door and pray to your Father who is in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you. And when you pray, do not heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do, for they think that they will be heard for their many words. Do not be like them, for for your Father knows what you need before you ask Him. Pray then like this, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. As far as the reading of God's holy word, and may he bless to our hearts this afternoon. And once again, our text is verse 10, specifically the the petition, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven in heaven. And let's uh, hear now what we believe and confess based on God's Word, and that's found in the Hatterberg Catechism, Lord's Day 49, question and answer 124. And uh, this is what we as a church uh, believe and confess based on God's Word. What does the third petition mean? Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven means help us and all people to renounce our own wills and without any back talk to obey your will, for it alone is good. Help everyone carry out his office and calling as willingly and faithfully as the angels in heaven. Well, brothers and sisters in Christ, have you ever wondered to yourself, what is God's will for my life? Should I take this job? Should I go to this school? Should I marry this person? Should I move to this location? How many kids should I have? And the questions could go on and on. And in order to answer this question, people do all sorts of things to try to discern God's will, like flip open to a random page of the Bible, and whatever they read there, they view as a sign for what they should do, what God might be telling them to do, which I admit, I've done that before in my Christian life when I was much younger, a youth and uh, immature in the Christian faith. Or they do things like try to discern some kind of sign from God, whether it be through a dream, a strange coincidence, or something else. And there are many who live in constant fear that they are outside of God's will, which I once used to have that fear as well. As if God has a sovereign plan that he'd really like us to be a part of, but we can just sort of step in and out of his plan. But none of this has anything to do with what the Bible teaches concerning the will of God. In fact, it has more to do with pagan superstition than with the biblical, with biblical, with New Testament biblical Christianity. Uh, No doubt in the Old Testament, God spoke to his people in many and many times and in many ways through prophecies, dreams, visions, as Hebrews 1 puts it, but in these last days, He's spoken to us once and for all in His Son. And we have His 
revelation, his sufficient word for our life in the Bible. And uh, we'll see that this afternoon. Uh, and, and yet, it's so tempting to live this way because we really struggle with not knowing everything. We want to know everything. We struggle with being finite creatures. And uh, it would be so much easier if we could have a direct line to God when we are struggling with difficult decisions. So I'm sure that we all wrestle to one degree or another with this, even though we might know the correct theology on this matter. And so I want to address this theme of the will of God this afternoon as we consider what it means to pray your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So consider with me this theme of the will of God and we'll first ask, what is God's will? What do we mean by the will of God? What is God's will? And then secondly, what does it mean to pray your will be done? And then third, how, we'll see how Christ obeyed God's will. But first, what is God's will? What is God's will? What is the will of God? Well, an important verse to consider regarding the will of God is Deuteronomy 29, verse 29, which says, the secret things belong to Yahweh, the Lord, our God. But the things that are revealed belong to us and to our children forever, that we may do all the words of this law. You hear the distinction there between the secret things that belong to the Lord our God and the revealed things that belong to us and to our children. Now, based on this verse, many theologians have distinguished between what's called God's decorative will, or His will of decree, on the one hand, and God's preceptive will, or His will of precept, on the other hand. Also referred to as His hidden will, that's His decorative will, and His revealed will, His preceptive will. Let's consider these two aspects of the will of God. Uh, God's decorative will is the sovereign, efficacious will of God. And it remains hidden to us until it comes to pass. And the Bible teaches that in some sense, God has decreed everything that comes to pass. Nothing escapes God's sovereign, decorative will. Ephesians 1.11 says, In Christ we have obtained an inheritance having been predestined according to the purpose of Him who works all things according to the counsel of His will. That's what we're talking about when we talk about His hidden will, His decorative will. It's His sovereign, efficacious will, whereby He sovereignly ordains all things that come to pass in some sense. And this is, this is what the Bible clearly teaches uh, that God sovereignly decrees or ordains every single thing that comes to pass. He, he's ordaining me standing right here, saying these things. He's ordained the, the nice weather we're having outside. He's, he's ordained the, uh, and allowed the coronavirus to come into our lives. Uh, everything He has ordained in, in some sense. Now we say in some sense because he doesn't ordain everything in exactly the same way. There we make distinctions between his direct and his indirect and working through means and whatnot. Um, we won't get into all that uh, this afternoon. But in some sense, God has sovereignly decreed or ordained everything that comes to pass. And yet, we also find in the Bible that man is responsible for his actions. God ordains all things in such a way that man remains responsible for his actions. He ordains everything in such a way that it doesn't violate man's will. Man still is a willing creature, responsible for his actions. Now, this is a, a mystery we can't fully understand, but this is the clear teaching of the Bible. We see this, for example, in, in perfect balance uh, explained in Genesis 50, verse 20, where you remember this is after um, the, the, this huge <laughs> uh, journey that Joseph has gone through in the end of Genesis, where his brothers had, were jealous of him, right? He told them 
he told them the dream that he had, that one day they're all going to bow down to him. And by the way, children, that's not a necessarily a good thing to tell your, your brothers and sisters. One day you're all going to bow down to me. Now, um, it doesn't hold necessarily say in the Bible at all that he did anything wrong. In fact, he's a type of Christ in the Bible. Um, and it was a, a real vision, a prophecy that he received from God in that dream. Um, but the, his brothers and sisters, his brothers didn't appreciate that, right? So they, and, and his brother, his father was also kind of gave him that uh, that that garment, that robe, right? That that made them kind of jealous as well. So what they do, they sold him into slavery, and he spent many years enslaved in Egypt. He was a, a servant in Potiphar's house, and but the Lord blessed him. He he became the best servant, the chief servant, the, with lots of responsibility. Uh, until eventually Potiphar's wife came along and tempted him, and he, he fled from Potiphar's wife from sexual immorality, but then he was in prison because he was falsely accused, and he spent uh, years in prison, right? And then he had those dreams, uh, or the Pharaoh, rather, had those dreams, and nobody could interpret these dreams, uh, but, uh, but Joseph knew how to interpret them, and so eventually he got out of jail. Now, there was lots of heartache there because first... Uh, uh, the cupbearer got out and the baker got out and uh, they were supposed to remember him, but they forgot about him. And so he spent more years. Eventually he got out though and he interpreted the Pharaoh's dreams and he uh, talked about how there's gonna be a great famine. That's what the dream was all about. There's gonna be a great famine in Egypt and the Pharaoh needed to store up. Uh, first, actually, there's gonna be a, a year of plenty, right? Seven years of plenty, then seven years of famine. Store up, he says to the Pharaoh as much as you can during that year of plenty, so that when the famine comes, you, you don't all die and starve to death. And the Pharaoh thinks this is amazing. Uh, and it's, he, here's a wise person who can interpret this dream, and he does it, and he puts Joseph in charge. He makes Joseph his right-hand man. Uh, he's now the, the right-hand man of Egypt. And, uh, and now, when his brothers and his parents are starving in Israel, in the Promised Land, uh, they, they have to go. And then we, we, we have that whole story of them going down to Egypt and, and coming into contact with their brother, not knowing that it's him. He's grown up. They don't recognize him. And uh, there's so much more I'd love to say about this story, but I got to get to the punch here. Uh, at the end of it all, when it's revealed to his brothers uh, that this is Joseph, and they're terrified that he's going to kill them. But what is Joseph saying? Genesis 50, verse 20, as for you, as for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good to bring it about that many people should be kept alive as they are today. There you have it. God is sovereign, His decorative will. He, God ordained it. God meant it for good. They meant it for evil. They're responsible. And God is sovereign. The Apostle Peter proclaims a similar thing to the Jews at Pentecost in Acts 2, verse 23. It's Pentecost Sunday. Let's hear some of Peter's sermon again. Acts 2, verse 23. This Jesus delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God, you crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. You hear that? God is sovereign. He decreed the crucifixion. He allowed it to happen. And he had a good plan, the salvation of his people, you and me. And yet Peter says, nevertheless, you crucified, you killed him, you're guilty, you're responsible. And so once again, in some sense, the Bible teaches that God has sovereignly decreed everything that comes to pass, even down to the details of a sparrow falling to the ground and the hairs falling from your head. And yet man is responsible for his actions. Now, there's, of course, I said, a great deal of mystery in what we might call hiddenness to this aspect of God's will. We don't know what God has decreed until it actually comes to pass. And even then, there are things that remain hidden to us, like why did he ordain one thing and not another? And the Bible doesn't encourage us to try to figure out God's hidden decorative will for our life, nor does it promise that God will reveal it to us. Rather, it encourages us to diligently attend to His revealed will. 
Deuteronomy 29, verse 29, again, says the secret things belong to the Lord our God, but the things that are revealed belong to us and to our children forever, that we may do all the words of this law. Furthermore, we are to praise God for the things that remain hidden. Romans 11, verse 33 says, Oh, the depth of the riches and wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are His judgments and how inscrutable His ways. For who has known the mind of the Lord or who has been His counselor? You see, prying into God's hidden will is really an affront to God's majesty. It's above our pay grade. It's not for us to hack into. So we are not to be concerned with what God has not revealed to us. Rather, He expects us to know His Word and to make wise decisions based upon His Word. The mature Christian is one who meditates on God's Word day and night and seeks to trust God's promises in His Word and to walk according to God's Word. And 2 Timothy 3, verse 16 to 17 is key here. It says that all Scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. Do you hear that? The Bible is sufficient to equip us for every good work. We don't need a vision or a dream. We don't need to open up to a random Bible verse. We, all we need is God's holy word in order to walk in a way that is pleasing to Him. And you know, God has revealed a lot to us in His word. How many of you have read the entire Bible? How many of you have read the entire Bible more than once? Or three times, or five times, or ten times? How many of you have mastered and memorized the Bible? There's enough of God's will in this Bible to keep you busy for the rest of your life. And you will never exhaust its riches. Even when you read the same thing over and over again, it continues to apply in new and fresh ways to your life. Do you ever experience that? As you read something you've read before and all of a sudden it comes to life in a new way uh, because maybe you missed it before or maybe just your life experience you're going through now and now it, it just hits you in a whole new way and ministers to you in a new way. And so if you ask me, Pastor, what is God's will for my life? My first response will be, do you have a Bible? If you do, I'm going to tell you to read it. If you don't, I'm going to get you a Bible. But I'm going to tell you to read it. I'm going to tell you to meditate on it. I'm going to tell you to hear it preached if you want to know God's will for your life. And if you have a decision to make, the first thing you should ask is, what does God's word say? Will it be a sin if I did or did not do this? Would it be Christ-like? Would it show love to God and my neighbor? We look to God's word to answer those questions. And if it's a difficult decision and it, it wouldn't be a sin either way, you've searched God's word and it's, it's not a sin either way, then you need to make a wise decision. You need to weigh the pros and cons. Ask for advice from others. Pray for God to give you wisdom from his word and from past life experiences and from others. And then make a decision. Just do something. Make a decision. Trusting God's sovereign decorative will for your good, that God has ordained everything for the good of those who love Him, for those who are called according to His purpose. Romans 8, 28, trust that promise. And so that's God's decorative will. It's His sovereign, efficacious will whereby He ordains all things that come to pass, and it remains hidden to us until it comes to pass. But then we also have His revealed will or His preceptive will, which is contained in the Bible. And let's focus on that a little more, that aspect of God's will in our second petition. What does it mean to pray, your will be done? When we pray, your will be done, the Bible tells us, um, or when we pray, your will be done, we're specifically focusing on this aspect of the moral will of God. Uh, the Bible tells us all that we need to know for salvation and how to bring glory to God in every circumstance. As I said, in other words, it reveals the gospel and the law, his precepts. And it also contains a great deal of wisdom in the wisdom literature. And this aspect of God's will, his preceptive will that is revealed in his word, in other words, his commands, his moral law, 
it can be resisted and obeyed, okay? So you cannot resist the decorative will of God. You are always in his decorative sovereign will. You don't go in and out of it. You cannot resist that. That's going to happen. It's going to come to pass. The Lord sits in the heavens and he does whatever he pleases. He is sovereign. But God's preceptive will can be resisted. It doesn't always come to pass. People step in and out of God's preceptive will all the time by living contrary to the Bible's commands. And so when we pray, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven, we are praying that we and others would obey God's preceptive or moral will perfectly. In other words, we are longing for the perfect sanctification of God's people. We are longing for God's name to be hallowed and His kingdom to come in such a way that He rules over us in consummate blessing and we submit to His rule in consummate love and obedience. As our catechism puts it, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven means help us and all people to renounce our own wills and without any backtalk to obey your will. I love that phrase, without any backtalk, right? I'm sure we all know about backtalk, don't we? How do I know this? <laughs> because we were all kids once, right? We all remember our parents asking us to do something that we didn't want to do. And perhaps we said something like, Ugh, why do we have to do this? Why do I got to clean my room? Why can't I do it later? Why do I got to clean the bathroom? It's so-and-so's turn to do it. I did it last time. And our parents say something like, hey, just do what you're told. Don't talk back. It's not always easy submitting to the will of someone in authority over us. But it is God's will to rule us through those whom he has given authority, whether it be our parents, our teacher, our boss, our pastors and elders, our federal, provincial, and local leaders. As long as they are not compelling us to sin or hurting us in some way, we are to respectfully submit to their authority and leadership. That doesn't mean we can't respectfully, respectfully strive for change, but in the meantime, we respectfully submit. Now, when it comes to God's authority, He is over all. He's the King over all, and His will must always be obeyed. His preceptive will must always be obeyed. We don't have the right to petition Him to change his moral will as revealed in his word. That would be for him to deny himself because the moral will of God is a revelation of who he is in his righteousness. Nor are we to grumble and complain about his will. Rather, we are to trust and obey his will even when it hurts. A good example of trusting and obeying God even when it hurts comes from Abraham's remarkable obedience in Genesis 17. You may recall that's where God gave Abraham circumcision as a sign and seal of the promises of the Abrahamic covenant. And he commanded Abraham to apply the sign of circumcision to all males in his household. And his obedience in the context of Genesis 17 is remarkable. Now why? Well, first, because Abraham obeyed even when things didn't go his way. God just told him a plan that was different than he had expected and hoped for. Abraham pleaded with God in Genesis 17, Oh, that Ishmael might live before you. Ishmael was his firstborn son, remember, through Hagar. But God said, no. God told Abraham, no. Your wife, Sarah, will bear the child of promise. Isaac was mercifully chosen to be the child of promise. And instead of being angry at God and kicking and screaming at God's sovereignty, he submitted to God's will. But how hard is that for us? When things don't go your way and you are frustrated with God's will, what is your response? Give God the silent treatment, perhaps? Stop praying? Skip church? start sinning more. We also easily succumb to sin when things don't go our way. 
But Abraham be, obeys in circumcising his whole household. He has the attitude of Job here, who after suffering the loss of his health, his house and his family said, though he slay me, I will hope in him. I will trust in him. And secondly, this is remarkable obedience because it was, it was painful to obey. No doubt it was painful to be circumcised at 100 years old during a time before anesthetics. Could you imagine the reaction he got from the men in his household when he goes home that day and he says, well, God spoke to me again. And they say, oh yeah, what did he tell you? Well, you're not going to like it. It's good news and bad news. The good news is we have a sign and seal of the covenant that's going to help uh, assure us of God's promises and strengthen our faith. But the bad news is it's y'all got to be circumcised. And that's the sign and seal of the covenant. No doubt, obedience was painful on that day. But beloved, sometimes obedience to God's revealed will and His Word is painful in various ways. It might mean persecution at work. It might mean paying your taxes, even when things are financially difficult. It might mean patiently persevering with your husband or wife's sins and not giving up on your marriage. It might mean denying yourself sexual pleasure until God is pleased to give you a spouse. Acts 14, 22 says, through many tribulations, we must enter the kingdom of God. But whatever suffering we face in this life, it won't be worth comparing to the glory that awaits us. And we have to trust that. And thirdly, Abraham's obedience was remarkable because his obedience here is immediate. In verse 26 of Genesis 17, we read that very day Abraham and his son Ishmael were circumcised and all the men of his house, those born in the house and those bought with money from a foreigner were circumcised with him. Abraham obeyed God that very day, it says. Something we say in our home is that to our children is delayed obedience is disobedience. And parents, you know the frustration of telling your child to come inside for dinner and after several warnings, they finally come. Or you know the frustration of telling a child to clean their room and you come back a few hours later and it's still a mess and they tell you, I'm working on it. You know, chill out, mom, chill out, dad, I'm working on it. I'll get it done. But beloved, delayed obedience is not obedience. Whatever obedience you are delaying put your sin to death and obey God's revealed word revealed will in his word today you know many ways we are we are like children who delay obedience we often treat our sins this way where we know that something is sinful and yet we resolve to improve our behavior later but beloved that's Satan's lie Satan's lie is enjoy this today you can always obey tomorrow but again, delayed obedience is disobedience. Whatever obedience you're delaying, put your sin to death and obey God's revealed will in his word today. And why should you obey today? Well, as our catechism puts it, for it alone is good. For it alone is good. We gotta, we gotta burn that into our memories and let it sink down into our hearts that his will alone is good. Our heavenly father knows what's best for us. He made us, he designed us disobedience is living against our design it not only harms us it not only harms others it harms us and he is the one who is infinitely wise he alone knows all things and he has proven that he is good and trustworthy through the cross of christ so for all these reasons we need to trust and obey his will without any back talk we need to be like the angels in heaven as our catechism adds Help everyone carry out his office and calling as willingly and faithfully as the angels in heaven. Have you ever thought about how the angels obey God's will perfectly? Did you know that? They don't need to pray, your will be done for themselves. They don't need to pray this prayer for themselves. They already obey God's will perfectly. Psalm 103 says, 
Bless the Lord, O you his angels, you mighty ones who do his word, obeying the voice of his word. You see, it's, it's only the fallen angels, the devil and the demons, who don't do God's will, uh, don't obey God's preceptive will. They hate God's will and all who desire to do God's will. And there is no redemption for them. But the good news for us is that there is redemption for us who fail to do God's will perfectly. You see, when we pray, your will be done, our prayer is that we and others would delight to obey God's will perfectly. But the problem is that we can't even begin to obey God's will apart from Christ. We've all sinned and fall short of the glory of God and by nature hate God's will. And we must have the righteousness of perfectly obeying God's will if we have any hope of entering heaven. Jesus said in Matthew 7, verse 21, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. 1 John 2, verse 17 says, the world is passing away along with its desires, but whoever does the will of God abides forever. You see, apart from Christ, we deserve to pass away with the world and its sinful desires and suffer the eternal wrath of God because we don't obey God's moral will, His preceptive will perfectly. But the good news is that Jesus came into this world and obeyed and fulfilled God's will perfectly so that we might be saved. And so notice with me now, this third point, how Christ obeyed God's will. Christ is the one to whom the promises made to Abraham ultimately pointed. He is Abraham's offspring in whom all the nations are blessed. And he is the one who supremely displays remarkable obedience. As, Ab as obedient as Abraham was, he was still a sinner who needed God's grace. Remember that time when he lied about Sarah, his wife being his sister, and put her in jeopardy in the Pharaoh, in the, uh, the Pharaoh's harem and, and put the whole line of promise in jeopardy, the promise of the Abrahamic covenant. He wasn't perfect. He was a sinner too. But Christ is the one who obeys perfectly in the most remarkable way. His obedience was immediate. It was always his delight to do his Father's will. John 6, 38 says, For I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. Obeying God's will was the air that Jesus breathed and was his daily bread. John 4.34, he says, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to accomplish his work. His obedience was immediate. His obedience was also painful. No one suffered like our Lord. The pain of circumcision that Abraham and his household experienced ultimately foreshadowed the pain of Christ's circumcision on the cross where he was cut off from the land of the living and forsaken by God the Father. And no doubt he obeyed, even though things didn't always go his way from a human perspective. No doubt the Son of God was one with God the Father in the eternal plan of salvation and sovereignly ordains all things. But no doubt like us in his humanity, he experienced the same fears and struggles that we all experience when things don't go our way. He was despised and rejected. He was acquainted with with grief, a man of sorrows, he was mocked and beaten and spit upon and died on a cross. Hebrews 5, 8 says, although he was a son, he learned obedience through what he suffered. And when he thought about the cross in the garden of Gethsemane, in the mystery of the incarnation, he was sorrowful unto death, it says, and yet he prayed, not my will, but yours be done. And he trusted himself to his father's plan, even though it meant he would drink the cup of God's wrath down to its dregs. And when he did, he then cried out, it is finished. It is finished. He accomplished his father's will, submitting to it always, immediately, even when it was painful, even when it meant much suffering. And because of his obedience to God's will, God raised him from the dead and exalted him to the right hand of God where he now rules over all things for the sake of his church and is our great high priest who ever lives to make intercession for us. Jesus went through all of that remarkably painful, 
inconvenient obedience for a sinner such as you and me to redeem us, stubborn children who are often slow to obey, to redeem an adulterous woman and make us his beautiful, pure bride forever. And so why should we pray your will be done and respond with remarkable obedience in our life? Because of what Christ has remarkably done for us in submitting to God's will unto death on a cross so that you and I could have eternal life. It's all a gift of free grace that we receive by faith alone. Let us walk in gratitude. And as much as you have sinned, if you have repented and trust in Christ alone for salvation, then God forgives you completely of all your sins. And you are now clothed once and for all in the righteousness of the one whose delight was to always do his Father's will promptly and willingly. And on the basis of his obedience to God's will, you will enter the kingdom of heaven. In the words of Jesus in John 6, 35, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger and whoever believes in me shall never thirst. All that the Father gives me will come to me and whoever comes to me I will never cast out for I have come down from heaven not to do my own will but the will of him who sent me. And this is the will of him who sent me that I should lose nothing of all that he has given me, but raise it up on the last day. For this is the will of my Father, that everyone who looks on the Son and believes in him should have eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. You see, we don't need to ultimately worry about our future if we trust in Christ. Our greatest problem has already been solved. Our greatest fears have already been done away with. The best possible future has already been secured for us in Christ. Nothing less than resurrection glory in the new creation under God's shining face forever. And not only that, but but also because of Christ, you can even have the assurance that God will work all things together for your good even the sinful and foolish, even might say the dumb decisions that you make. You are still responsible for them, but thankfully God is able to turn them even for your ultimate good as Romans 8, 28 tells us. And so don't live in fear of whether or not you are in or out of God's sovereign decorative will. You are always in God's sovereign decorative will. And He will, and His ultimate will for you is your good. And He will use even all of your sinful, foolish decisions for your ultimate good. And rest in that. But strive with all your might, enabled by the Holy Spirit, to obey God's revealed will and His word. What is God's will for your life? In the words of the Apostle Paul in 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 3. For this is the will of God, your sanctification. And so let us continue to strive by God's Spirit to live a sanctified life in thought, word, and deed. Let us obey God's revealed will in His Word in gratitude for the salvation revealed in Christ. Let us pray in the words of our catechism, your will be done, which means help us and all people to renounce our own wills and without any back talk to obey your will for it alone is good. Help everyone carry out his office and calling as willingly and faithfully as the angels in heaven. And where we fail, let us continually seek refuge in the blood and righteousness of Jesus Christ alone. Let us trust that nothing will separate us from God's love for us in Christ. And thanks be to God that one day in heaven we will, think about this, one day in heaven we will obey God's will perfectly And no longer need to pray this prayer because God will answer it. Amen. Let's pray. Almighty God, graciously grant that your word, which we have heard, may be inscribed inwardly on our hearts. As we receive your word meekly with pure affection, may our hearts be filled with love and reverence for you. Cause us to bear the fruit of the Spirit and to live in holiness, diligently following your revealed will and your word. 
And may it please you to use us to lead those who are lost, wandering, and confused into the way of truth. All this we pray for the honor and praise of your name through Jesus Christ our Lord in the power of the Holy Spirit. And Father, we pray that your will would be done in our marriages. Help us as husbands and wives to love one another self-sacrificially, to honor each other. May our marriages be a picture of Christ and His church. Help us to be patient and loving and kind to our spouses, to be slow to speak, quick to listen, slow to anger. Help us to forgive each other in our marriages. And may our marriages magnify the glory of Your name. And Father, we pray that Your will be done and our relationships between parents and children. Help us as parents to be faithful fathers and mothers to our children, to love them with the same kind of love that you have given us in Christ. Help us to be patient and tender-hearted. Help us to uh, be firm in the truth and to discipline in love um, according always to your word and in a Christ-like way, and, and help us to raise our children in the nurture and admonition of the Lord, to teach them your revealed will. The hidden things belong to the Lord our God, but the things that are revealed are for us and for our children. And so help us to teach our children your word. And Father, we pray for our children, they would grow in every good direction in Christ, and grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Father, we pray for also our singles, that you would bless them and strengthen them in their singleness, that they would magnify your grace and power in their life, that they would walk by the Spirit and um, bear the fruit of the Spirit in their life. And uh, Father, we pray for our expectant uh, mother, Karen, that you would bless her and bless the child in her womb and bring about a safe and happy um, full-term delivery and Strengthen Karen and Wayne uh, to be faithful Christian parents. Father, we also praise you uh, for the completion of our first uh, profession of faith class for several of our youth. We pray that you would continue to work in them and all of our covenant children and youth by your spirit and grow them in maturity in Christ. Increase in all of our baptized members a desire to publicly profess their faith and become communicant members of our church. And Father, we pray that you would bring back prodigal sons and daughters, convict them of their sins, help them to return in repentance and, uh, and trust in Jesus Christ. Uh, Father, we also pray for the salvation of others. Our, uh, help us to share the gospel with our loved ones, our neighbors, our coworkers on social media. Uh, we, we long to see uh, others blessed. Uh, by the gospel of Jesus Christ and by your Holy Spirit. Help us to share the hope within us. Open the hearts of those around us. Father, we pray for Pastor Kim and the Cream Ministry that you'd bless them at this time. Help Pastor Kim to preach your word faithfully and continue to unify and um, keep together the, the brothers and sisters in that group. And, and may they grow in maturity in Christ on this Lord's Day. Father, we pray for one of our missionaries in our federation, for Pastor Nali Malabuyo. Uh, and the church plant in Big Springs, California. We give you thanks for your mercy upon them, as many of them are over 70, and no one among, uh, and no one among their members and friends have been infected with COVID-19. We praise you for that. And as many of them remain home during this time and feel lonely, we pray for your comforting presence by the Holy Spirit. And we also pray for the shortened services that they've begun over the last two weeks with 10 people. We pray that you would bless their services and strengthen and nurture the faith of the people gathered there. Almighty God, who has promised to hear the petitions of those who pray in your Son's name, we ask you mercifully to incline your ear to us who have now made our prayers and supplications to you. Grant that those things that we have faithfully asked according to your will may be obtained to the relief of our needs and to the setting forth of your glory. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, we pray. Amen.